presentation of this program made possible by grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is a place on the planet Earth. It has no name because no one is here to name it. This is a time when no one is here. A place and a time claimed by the sun for oasis and thick growth, ringed with an aura of blue tides. This is the quiet jungle land, alive with creatures in a creature paradise. This will one day be called prehistoric. Later, the New World, then Spanish territory, currently Florida. Few of these prehistoric beasts will survive the names and the millennia and carry on the tradition of the tropical paradise. The alligator lived among dinosaurs during the age of reptiles 180 million years ago. Although one of his early ancestors, Phobosuchus, sometimes grew to a length of 40 feet with a six foot head, he was a relatively small animal in an age referred to as the terrible lizards. As the Mesozoic era passed and other reptilian dinosaurs became herbivorous, the alligator continued to be a flesh eater. This trait, combined with a strong maternal instinct, an absence of predators and amphibious abilities, enabled the alligator to outlive the age of reptiles and thrive in the age of mammals. Millions of years later, when man first made his way into the wilds of Florida, he found this ancient reptile in abundance. 
the overgrown peninsula must have seemed a place out of time, a wealth of nature, a paradise. An early naturalist, William Bartram, explored the southern United States in the late 1700s. While in Florida, he recorded this confrontation with an alligator. Behold him rushing forth from the flags and the reeds, his enormous body swells, his plated tail brandished high floats upon the lake. The waters, like a cataract, descend from his opening jaws. Clouds of smoke issue from his dilated nostrils. The earth trembles with his thunder. While this fearsome creature was not taken lightly, his huge numbers were taken for granted. In the spring of 1844, Edward Anderson, exploring Florida for President John Tyler, mentioned in his diary that he and his men amused themselves by shooting alligators as they ran along the banks of Lake George. Shortly behind these first naturalists came the first builders into Florida, changing the face of the wilds into habitable areas for man. About the time the railroads were clearing the way for the development of South Florida, the tanning of alligator skins began, and the alligator, previously useless to man, took on a dangerous economic value. Alligators dig dens in shallow water and hibernate in these short tunnels during the winter. When droughts occur, these dens will hold water long after the surrounding area has dried up. They become small oases for the wetland animals as well as a refuge for the alligator. In the spring, the alligators emerge and begin mating rituals 180 million years old. The males fight to establish dominance in territories and then mate freely among the polygamous females. The playful courtships are carried on with the aid of 18 communication signals, including six separate vocalizations, a simple but eloquent vocabulary. Ross Allen, a self-taught expert on reptiles, has listened to the alligator all of his life. The bellowing of an alligator is just a tremendous noise that they make with a great deal of effort causing even the water to ripple around them. Uh, and they throw their head back and roar. Uh, it takes six seconds for them to bellow, and it takes so much energy that they only bellow about five to seven times at one, one time without rest. Uh, the bellowing is done with their mouth closed and, uh, and so that the noise is forced out through their uh, nostrils and the, uh, the effort of this strain makes their body tremble. And a long time ago, the Spaniards saw this and thought that the alligators were spitting forth smoke and fire. So they, they were even considered monsters were bellowing uh, fire and were sort of uh, made a good story. A month after mating, the female begins building her nest. Dr. Archie Carr, graduate research professor at the University of Florida, has studied many of these nests, some of them built on his own property. Something that surprised us here was the length of time that it takes an alligator to make uh, a nest. She takes up to three weeks, or well, once uh, two or three days more than three weeks in building these things, putting on just a little bit, crawling across it, <clears throat> going away and pondering the matter for two or three days and coming back and do it some more before finally uh, she considers it ready to receive the eggs. Then she digs a hole in the top and backs up onto it, lays the eggs, puts on more stuff, crawls over it some more, and then goes away. It's at that time that this, this uh, strict guarding regimen is established. And then the recently uh, confirmed reality of the digging out of the um, eggs by the female and the actual carrying of eggs or young down to the water to ensure that the babies get across whatever distance uh, exists between the nest and the, and the side of the water. 
In 1976, Eugene Meyer, a field biologist from New York University, shot this film footage in the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. A mother alligator is transporting her newborn from her nest to the water by scooping them up in her mouth. This is the first documentation of this activity, rarely observed by humans. In captivity, however, the mother alligator gets no such chance to care for her young. Each summer, Clyde Hunt, owner of an alligator farm in Bushnell, Florida, opens the nests built by mother alligators in the overgrown areas of his farm. The aggressive maternal behavior of mother alligators is a unique trait among reptiles. Hunt is driving this mother gator from her nest so he can remove the eggs for incubation, where their chances of survival are increased. 86 is considered the optimum temperature to incubate alligator eggs. If you go uh, 88 or 89, you get all male alligators. If you go 83 to 86, you get all female alligators. Be careful that you don't turn the eggs over. You can drown the embryo. Pick them up and put them back down exactly like you pick them up. Some ants already in this nest. They probably would never hatch if I didn't dig them. three dozen. You can count them for sure before we put them in the incubator. I have to keep a watchful eye for Mama sometimes. She forgets about her whipping and coming back anyway. They're not all as aggressive she, as she is. She sure thinks a lot of her nest. She's a real good mother. Sixty days after they are laid, the eggs will hatch. Prior to hatching, the infant alligator begins grunting within the egg. With a small egg tooth at the tip of its nose, it is slow at first to break the inside of its shell. But once the outer shell is cracked, it emerges in an instant. With eyes already open, it is alert and active and immediately begins to walk. It drags the cracked shell still attached to its stomach by a fragile pink umbilical cord. The activities of captive alligators are far different from those who live out their lives in the wild. Alligators born in captivity may never see their mother, will never have to fight for food, will never be hunted by raccoons. They will grow into mild-mannered adults with humans playing an essential role in their lives. Even before they are born, their sex will be determined by the temperature at which the eggs are kept during incubation. The wild alligator is far less predictable. In risking the dangers of his habitat, he learns survival and as an adult becomes an able predator. Very early in his life, while still under the protection of his mother, he finds a place within the social order among the other infants, a social standing he will hold for all of his days. But the young alligators suffer a high mortality rate. Only a small percentage survive their first three years. The ecosystem manages this thing in an alarmingly effective way. But just the normal, uh, predatory influence of great blue herons and whatever else there is, coons and such, uh, have made it so that at 
any given moment, you hardly ever see more than one or two young alligators after she stopped guarding. I think the great blue heron is one of the real uh, tough predators on young alligators. I know it is. Of course, black bass eat them too. Even bullfrogs have been seen to eat them. Everybody eats baby alligators. Growing approximately one foot per year, at the end of four years, the alligator is large enough to prey on all his former predators, including humans. But with their keen senses of smell and hearing, they can detect approaching humans and will avoid them. Right behind their eyes are ears, little flaps that lift up. They can hear well. They can even hear underwater. They can. I've called them when they were in the swamp, about six feet under, and I've made an alligator call, and they've come up to see what kind of an alligator I was. Now, you can do that, too. You can just learn to call. You can speak to an alligator. This is the way you say hello. <coughs> Alligators have all kinds of sounds. They bellow like bulls. They snort, snap their jaws, blow and hiss, and wiggle their tails to express their feelings. And baby alligators get in trouble. They holler for help for their mother to come rescue them because they, they need help sometimes when predators are eating them. So they sound like this. Ow! 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 And then when alligators grow up six feet long, then they're adults. And then they fall in love and they have a love call. And sometimes they blow bubbles under each other's chin and give the love call like this. I never give that one in a swamp. Right there. <laughs> Alligators live to be probably 75 years old at the most. They start out as at eight inches long, grow all the way up to 16 feet sometimes. But they've been reported up to 19 feet. They have musk glands right underneath their jaws that do does more to protect alligators than anything else. See, they emit musk when they're scared or hurt, and this serves as a warning to other alligators of the danger. For example, a long time ago, when I used to go out to a pond to catch a bunch of alligators, I could catch the first one easily, but not the second one. The second one knew about the danger from the musk of the first one. They, the alligators use their body to swim. If they're swimming slowly, they paddle with their feet. They're, the feet are partially webbed, so they can swim long. But they won't swim fast. They fold their feet back against their body and use their tail and swim 15 miles an hour. Alligators have an epiglottis in their throat, keeps the water out when they charge forward with their mouth open. Open up, open up, open up wide. Come on, he doesn't want to. He, uh, come on now, little George. I said open up. Open up, I want you to let the sun light in all the way back here. That's it. Back there, you get the sun. The epiglottis keeps the water out when he's swimming with his mouth open. Alligators have short, strong teeth, made to grip with, so they grab something too large to swallow, they can crush it. Now they, alligators always have good teeth because new ones grow in all the time. Replace the old ones. They are a wonderful animal. They can swim 15 miles an hour. They can run on land very fast. By leaping and jumping, they get tremendous speed of a, with a short distance, of course, of 35 miles an hour. And, and so I hope they're here to stay.
Alligators are naturally shy of man, except in populated areas where they become accustomed to human presence, especially if humans feed them for amusement. This is when things get dangerous for both alligators and humans. An alligator that is antagonized or fears danger to its nest will seldom think twice about attacking a human. But unlike the crocodile, which has been known to attack humans for no apparent reason, alligators are basically not aggressive. Although their attack is sure and swift, it rarely results in death. In the summer of 1976, Ernest Jackman was attacked by an alligator while swimming in a lake behind his home in Donellan, Florida. The following summer, he was attacked again in the same lake. Both times he was severely injured. Both times the alligator released him. It was a real dark night. I always did swim at night. And uh, undoubtedly the alligator couldn't see me. I never did see him before or afterwards. And uh, he just grabbed hold of my arm and let go immediately. But there were some pretty deep marks in the arm. Second time was uh, about 100 yards down from here. And uh, that was about 7.30 in the evening. It was plenty late, so I was not uh, apprehensive about any trouble, really. But uh, this was a real large one. It came up either behind me or to one side because I didn't see it at all until uh, I just felt my head being in a vice. And it uh, uh, bit me on the head and the neck like this at the same time. Immediately let go and almost immediately grabbed uh, my arm, my wrist, and uh, took me down under just very briefly, maybe only three or four feet, and let me go. And uh, that was all there was to it. The Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission has had a long and involved relationship with the alligator. For many years, the commission has studied the animal's activities and environment. In addition to tagging alligators to trace their movements, they count nests for population estimates, research their physical peculiarities, and relocate nuisance alligators. Tommy Hines is the Game and Fish Commission's biologist in charge of alligator research and works with biologist Dave Dietz. We're measuring growth rates of these hatchlings. We're measuring mortality of the hatchlings. These pods stay, these hassling pods stay together uh, clear through until next year and perhaps through the second year in some cases. Tag number is 2753. This is a new capture. So we're interested to see what the productivity of these different habitat types are. We're looking at these same parameters in different areas. Snout vents 13.6. Snout vents 13.6. Total is 27.7. Total is 27.7. And we already see differences. They're more successful in, in, in some habitats than they are others, as, as you find any wildlife species. And then we have other size classes uh, that we've tagged previously that we're monitoring growth rates on. Fifty-six grams. The weight is fifty-six grams. Uh, if we know growth rates of the various size classes, if we know nest success, if we know uh, hassling mortality, if we know the sex ratio, uh, then we can take all these things and plug them into to a, a computer and predict, hopefully, uh, what will happen if we remove this size class or if we remove this size class or a certain number of this size. And we can look at management alternatives. Oh, it's regenerated to me. What you say? Yeah. 1900. 1900 grams of weight. Alligator's vulnerable, first of all, because it's big and conspicuous and does eat people's dogs once in a while and has attacked people. It produces big nests that everybody can see. And if, you know, if the nests are made anywhere around where there are people, the nests are easy to see. And 
these these factors make it uh, both uh, easy to get at in terms of, of destruction exploitation and also create a climate among the unthinking public that makes them actually want to get rid of it. Some of the, the people who live around where there are alligators want the alligators away. If it is a big, uh, raunchy bull alligator that's eating their dogs and menacing their children, you can sympathize with this. But this is not always the restriction that they put on it. Some people simply want every alligator gone out of the water anywhere near where they are. This is one aspect of its vulnerability, the fact that it has big teeth and is a carnivore and is naturally a predator. This naturally makes a certain percentage of the population its uh, natural enemy. While not totally harmless, the alligator would surely be content to live out his days without any contact with humans. They are private creatures, and the rituals of their lives are simple and constant. They spend long hours in the sun. Lazy bones, laying in the sun. Ain't got to worry about getting nothing done. You mean and green and don't do a thing. Bones, lazy bones, lying on a rock. You better be careful not to swallow no clock. The cap and hook be after you. You might become somebody's shoe. Oh, lazy bones. In 1967, its population severely crippled. The alligator, along with the 29 other species of crocodilians, was placed on the endangered species list. The United States successfully encouraged international treaties to ban the sale of alligator hide products. This was the only effective way of protecting the 29 other species of alligators and crocodiles throughout the world. But even with this protection, only the American alligator responded. It revived so well that alligators began to be a nuisance. In the last few years, Game and Fish has received an average of 10,000 nuisance alligator complaints per year. The most common of these complaints is from the appearance of an alligator in the backyard, and frequently that of an alligator gobbling down a family pet, a direct result of amusement feeding. Dr. Roy McDermott is a herpetologist at the University of South Florida and a member of the Endangered Species Advisory Committee. There's no doubt that the large nuisance, so-called nuisance gator, is a problem in urban areas. Uh, part of the difficulty that's come about is uh, people feeding gators in urban areas, throwing marshmallows to them, encouraging their uh, association with boat docks and things like that. There certainly needs to be a push to discourage uh, feeding of alligators in urban areas. Uh, this is a major problem. When alligators lose their fear of people, this results in people-alligator conflict, which is the thing we're trying to avoid. The increase in, in, uh, in nuisance calls have been, has been a function of increase in human population, people moving into alligator habitat, plus an increase in, in alligator population. Although we can't document with our present techniques exactly how much alligator populations have increased, uh, we're very confident uh, that they've increased uh, 
quite a bit. When he's in contact with humans, we've got a problem, a very serious management problem, particularly if it's large animals. Now, people will tolerate the smaller size classes, but when you get uh, 10, 12, and even larger size alligators, very close to humans, uh, he is a potential threat. Uh, probably not that serious, but the potential is still there. There's no question but what under some circumstances that he's a threat. So I, I think the future is relatively bleak for the large alligator in close contact with man, and I think we're going to have to do something to remove that size class out of that, uh, that area. In South Florida particularly, the wetlands have been altered by draining off large areas and creating hundreds of miles of inland waterways. Alligators take naturally to these canals, and their contact with humans there is inevitable. But the gators' recovery problems were exacerbated by the recent widespread development of the state. In order to accommodate Florida's huge population growth, the natural environment has been greatly manipulated. Wild habitat and wild country is diminishing in the state, and this is a, um, a sad trend. On the other hand, at the same time, Florida seems to be growing in, in uh, conservation conscience at a tremendous rate also. So what we've got, I think, is a race. And the fact that we've got an Everglades National Park and that we've got the Okefenokee more or less protected up there gives us a good deal of alligator habitat. The question is, is the alligator going to disappear everywhere else along the line? I think the same question can be asked about almost any wild species that, that, comes, that, that is under stress or likely to come under stress with a continued growth, because we will have continued growth until we create such chaos and such a shambles, as I judge we have almost created down on the southeast coast, that, that uh, it stops. Uh, because of the mess it's made of itself. I don't think it's hopeless. I think there's a good chance that we can save good big chunks of moderately well-organized natural systems, but certainly it's scary to look at what's been lost in the distant past and right up until today. By 1976, the commission felt that the alligator population and the nuisance gator complaints had both increased to a dangerous degree. It was proposed that the American alligator be removed from the endangered list and be put on the less critical threatened list and that supervised, highly restricted gator killing could resume. In 1977, the Department of Interior removed the American alligator in Florida from the endangered species list, only the second creature to be saved from the danger of extinction. He's pretty good size gator. Yeah. You just stick your hand down there. Sure. <laughs> Hand me that paddle. I like that. All right. Just, all right, yeah, can you shove it on back? But this ecological triumph was overshadowed by the nuisance gator problem. 
The commission has two clear choices in the method of handling nuisance alligators. One is to find the troublesome alligator and relocate him to an unpopulated area. The other choice is to kill the alligator and sell its hide, a choice which the Game Commission favors. This sale of alligator hides, Game and Fish Commission, number seven. Experienced gator hunters would be licensed and reimbursed through the sale of nuisance gator hides. Game and Fish has established an elaborate tagging system devised to keep track of individual hides from the killing to the tanning. The hunter's compensation is handled through a commission-controlled sale. At the first auction, several hundred hides were sold at a lucrative $18.50 per foot. The Florida alligator was legally, economically important once again. John and Roland Denise have been licensed by the state as hunters. As far as what I get them with, I got two or three methods here. This is a gig that I use in a pole, and I gig them and they take the line and they go out with this, run out about 20 foot, and when he gets tired, I just go pick this jug up, and he's gigged into it. And then I pull him in, and then I got a convincer to make sure that he'll get in the boat with me, and it's this little jewel right here. And when I convince him to get in the boat, he really does it. Sometimes, I use this. This is another convincer. This is a, a little hatchet right here. And just I convince him to get in the boat with this also. But mainly, if it's a real big one, like a 12, 13 foot or something like that, I use this big convincer. And, and he generally always does what I want him to do. I have a noose on a pole over there. And I slip it around his neck, hopefully, if everything works out right, and just pull him up in it slides down around his neck. And then you really got to hang on because that's when the fun begins. And then you just hold on like that and fight him until you get through, until he settles down a little bit, and then you pull him in the boat. And if everything works out fine, we're going to relocate him right here on my premises, and then we're going to take his coat off. <laughs> we're going to take his skin. <laughs> the Denise brothers were licensed because of their experience. Some of it gained when alligator hunting was outlawed. I think the last hides I sold was about $5 a foot. So you can see there's quite a difference in what it is now. Well, we was poaching gators, I guess is what you would say. <laughs> Same places we, we're doing it legal now. <laughs> and uh, that was years ago. Everybody else is doing it too, so you know how you going to act. Different people that had done this before, and they just said, go to this place and somebody will meet you there. And so I did. And, man come out and we go to talking about who you know, you know so and so. He said, yeah, I said, okay, well, what y'all holding? And we'd tell him and he'd go and put the money on us and we'd tear out. And they, well, I just brought him up to a place <laughs> and they paid for him and we took off. I never did know what those people's names was. But, um, well, we're legal now, you know, and it's take a lot more, I guess you could say, take more pride in what you're doing and uh, take, you know, better, better care of the hides and everything. Oh, yeah, well, the only thing the difference is we, we don't shoot them now. We can't shoot them now, and back then we were shooting. But basically, we got the same tools that we used then that we do now.
We're just going to drag him up here a little bit where y'all can kind of see him. I would say he weighs in the neighborhood of about 250 to 300 pounds, and he's approximately 10 foot long. And uh, you can see his foot onto him. He's kind of a big gator there. And uh, I had to hit him more than one time to convince him to get in my boat. Okay. All right, this is how we put the tag in him right after we kill him. And that identifies it as the he tag. A legal alligator. Legal alligator according to the state of law. <laughs> Never underestimate the speed of one of these things. That's where a lot of people get in uh, trouble. Uh, and then they, they start laying up along shore and they try to start feeding them. And then the next thing they want to do is get a little bit closer and then they want to start feeding them out the hands. And an alligator, uh, you can't distinguish between the food and the hand that feeds them. And that's when people start getting bit. Of course, if there was no people around, the alligator uh, wouldn't be a problem to anybody. And uh, so it's people is what's, what has what's really caused the alligator problem in more ways than one. Uh, used to be, you used to take these alligators out remote areas, turn them loose, just get rid of them. Uh, there's no more remote areas. Uh, of course, like everything else that's in the, in the wild, when it comes to nature, uh, Nature's gonna have to take a second seat because people are gonna take over. But one's gotta give, you know who's gonna give. But the Game Commission solution may have created a few more problems. There are several questions related to ways of dealing with nuisance gators. Uh, I think that, uh, in my opinion, and I think I speak for most of the people on the committee, is that the nuisance alligator, a large animal living in an urban area, is a problem and it, needs, it is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, the Game and Fish Commission has proposed that this be addressed in one manner. I'm not convinced, nor are other people, that this is the proper way to look at it. That is, the, the commissioning or hiring of agents uh, who probably, or who by specification are uh, experienced with alligators and who probably, therefore, are old poachers. Okay which is all right if they do the job. But then they, what they do is they contact these people, and these people are then hired on a uh, skin, produce skin basis to go out and solve the nuisance gator problem. Well, what this potentially can lead to is that if you get a, you are an agent of the Game and Fish Commission, you get a call that there's a nuisance gator over in such and such a place of such and such a size, will you please go over and solve the problem? You may go over and spend two or three days looking for it and not find it. Right, but you can solve the problem in terms of producing a gator of that size by going out someplace and shooting one and bringing it in. Now, the difficulties of evaluating how effective that program is to control nuisance gators right, is one that I'm very concerned about. For example, how, are you, how is the commission going to, to um, uh, follow up, so to speak, and know that the gator that was brought in is, in fact, the one that's in the area and the one that's causing the problem? Those are the kinds of questions that that come to mind. Uh, the, the relative costs of paying for alligators, uh, or alligator hunters, agents, if you like, as compared to Game and Fish Commission people doing it, I don't think has been really evaluated in terms of a, of a cost uh, management basis kind of an analysis. But most of all, the scientists objected to the sale of the nuisance alligator hides. With this sale, Florida would enhance the most dangerous threat to all species of alligator and crocodile, the commercial hide industry. I think there should be no leather market in the USA. I think it was uncontrolled back when hunting gators was legal. When they began to close regionally, it made the effective protection of the regional uh, laws much more difficult for there to be open seasons in other places for smuggling, uh, poaching and smuggling thrive uh, under this controlled uh, dribbling of hides into a market for various reasons. The skin on the underbelly of an alligator makes beautiful and durable leather. It is, in fact, far more durable than any other leather made. It is also far more costly. The hide of a six-foot alligator will make six pairs of boots, and each pair 
will retail for several hundred dollars. But the entire hide is not always usable. A six-foot gator has spent five to six years in the wilderness, fighting for food, digging dens, and generally giving his hide a tough beating. From this comes the premise behind alligator farming. Raise a gator in captivity, make sure he lives an easy, well-fed life, and the hides will be long, wide, and beautiful. In 10 years, Clyde Hunt's breeding stock has grown to 1,800 alligators. For Hunt, this farm is the culmination of a lifetime relationship with the alligator, including years of illegal gator hunting. We were going over into Lake County one night hunting, had the airboat behind the car, and we met a game commission vehicle. We met them head on on the road, and we just met and passed, and I, uh, Rob asked if, if I thought we should continue on our trip or turn around and go back home. I said, well, I don't see any reason to change our plans. Let's go on hunting. We always figure that they're watching us anyway, which they generally were, or we always supposed they were. So we went on hunting, and I had frequently made the remark that there wasn't any six of them guys going to take my clothes off and look for my hides. Well, that's the way I brought them out. I'd take my clothes off and wrap the hides around my body and put the clothes back on. Real tough guy, you know. But later on that night, I found out I wasn't quite so tough. There was five of them. <laughs> It didn't even take six to find my hides. But as it worked out, it was a good thing. It did break our habit of alligator hunting and started me on the road to alligator farming. And I wouldn't take anything now for that opportunity, and it would not have occurred had we not been arrested. In 1967, Hunt started out with 25 adult alligators, which he began to breed. I reasoned that if you put them in a natural pond and they didn't know they were in captivity, that they would act like they weren't in captivity, and it proved to be true, because the next year I had three nests, and we hatched uh, better than 90% of the eggs. I feed them chicken and fish, and uh, <clears throat> occasionally I'll grind up a cow, but they won't eat it in its whole form, because they're not, they've never had it in a whole form. They, won't know, they don't know what to do with a whole animal. These are domestic alligators. They just don't act like wild alligators. I guess maybe their hunting instincts have been dulled. And uh, except for the females during the nesting period, they're not aggressive. They're, they're almost pets. I don't think they have enough intelligence to become pets, but they are domesticated. I'd just rather watch them and observe them and enjoy them than to kill one. In fact, I don't know exactly how I'm going to feel when it comes to skinning these I've raised. I think I might have to hire somebody to do it. Nevertheless, that's my ultimate goal, is to raise alligators like other people do cattle and harvest them, Come on. which means, of course, to slaughter them. The concept of an alligator farm is in a curious position among conservationist thought. On one hand, its success has the potential of totally wiping out local black market poaching. But while the Florida alligator farm is encouraging the survival of local wild alligators, it may be signing the death warrant for the 29 other species of alligators and crocodiles. The increased commercial activity generated by these farms could also raise the international market for hides to an all-time high. This could push all of these species, all of them endangered, to the verge of extinction. You know, I feel like that uh that the alligator is going to be harvested to begin with, irregardless. Uh, secondly, he represents a hazard and a threat to a lot of people. Take a South Florida rancher. If an alligator is killing his calves, he's going to kill it. He's going to waste it. Uh, and more importantly, he may drain that piece of wetlands that that alligator lives in, which is, is my way of thinking, some of the most critical habitat we have in this state is our wetlands. So if we've got another species that will add some value to that section of wetlands because he ha has some potential monetary value, uh, then perhaps uh, we can slow down that process. Uh, we can prevent that rancher or encourage that rancher to not drain that last little section of marsh that he's got on, on the backside of his place. As it is, the alligator represents a threat to him and to his, his cattle operation. Uh, 
if the alligator's worth as much as a calf, he won't worry so much about the alligator eating a calf. Huh? We know that there are many species of, many, some species of crocodilians in the world which are in, uh, in a great danger of going extinct. In fact, uh, one whole family of crocodilians, gavials in India, uh, are probably will go extinct in our lifetime. There are other populations in other areas which have been heavily decimated primarily for hides. An increase in the development of a market for alligator products in this country uh, could very well have a detrimental effect on crocodilian species in other parts of the world. And this is a, this is a great concern. If we're leading, if this country, in terms of conservation practices and whatever, is, is setting uh, the, uh, the, word, the goals or is leading the way for underdeveloped nations, in which we are in many instances, then we, uh, we should make, make damn sure that what we're preaching to other people to do, we're doing ourselves. And if, in fact, we are uh, encouraging the development of a hide market in crocodilian species and telling other people not to shoot them, not to kill them because they're diminishing, then there's a, there's a major problem here, uh, if you like, a, a real dichotomy. We're not dependent upon the alligator as a food resource. It's not comparable to situations where uh, in underdeveloped nations where people are absolutely dependent upon things, so they go out and hunt them and eat them, or that kind of thing. We're talking about luxury items. And I just don't think this society needs to exploit uh, a natural population for that kind of thing when we have other alternatives. That's my basic, one of my basic disagreements about the alligator management program. It's no different, as I said earlier, than, um, than shooting egrets for pulling out their feathers or shooting ostriches and pulling out their feathers to put on somebody's hat because that's fashion for the day. In recent years, Florida has put the alligator to every conceivable use. There was a time, hundreds of years ago, when a more natural balance existed. Indians lived in Florida then. They lived among nature. Indeed, they were a respectable part of nature. Like us, they killed the alligator. They ate the meat of the alligator's tail. But unlike us, they never killed the animal for amusement. They didn't wear its skin as high fashion. In time, the more sophisticated white man arrived in Florida, and with his rifle, he changed everything. But a certain balance still existed. Alligators were killed as never before, but their numbers were large and seemingly inexhaustible. And the wilderness of Florida, like the alligator, was as stubborn as it was exotic. The problems began when more and more people found the peninsula a desirable place to live. They followed the bulldozer everywhere. If a river ran through a usable area, no harm to divert it. If a marsh bordered a livable area, no harm to fill it. If something was in the way, no harm to move it. Civilization had to go somewhere, so it went. We made ourselves at home in the alligator's home. And then we sent him back in. We used him, we changed him. And now, if we like, we can kill or save him. But if we remove his natural habitat and raise him in captivity, have we saved him? 
Can this fattened farm animal be compared to its fierce and self-sufficient ancestors who roamed the Everglades in a time when the Everglades had no name? The questions before us must not be underestimated. The survival of a unique and ancient creature is at stake. Shall we give up the wetlands and the wild plants and animals that live there and have lived there for centuries? Are we going to use another animal until it is used up? Or will we leave it alone in its wild environment? The Florida coastline, the rivers and lakes, the wetlands will never be the same without it. Presentation of this program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.